Good morning, Bethany Church. I'm Joe Carlson, pastor of Bethany, and I welcome you to this morning service. We've been going through the book of James, and we'll be continuing that journey today, talking about the last or the middle portion of chapter one and the lures of life. And we all have them. We all have things, and some of them are particular to us, but we are we are designed to know God, and at the same time, we have intrinsically built into us these fault lines, these lures that can bring us down. This practical book of James will give us the words for life for what we face. Before we get into God's word though today, I'd like to just inform you a, a little bit about what's going on here at Bethany Church. You can download our bulletin on our website at bethanyscofield.org and you can find out all these details for yourself. And just walking you through the program today, there's a few things I'd like you to be aware of. We continue to meet on Sundays, 8.30 and 10. Our 8.30 service, please wear a mask. And it's your choice for the 10.30, but we encourage that. We want to have a, a safer society and safer place to visit. And we hope Bethany is part of that solution. If you download the bulletin, you'll see a number of praise items and prayer items. But one of the things, it's related to our live stream, maybe what you're watching right now, that's a praise. We've seen a growth, a steady, regular growth in our live stream audience. And we praise God for that. We hope that the word of God is going out and in filling and enriching the lives of people and while we believe it's important, it's so important that we gather together, that we meet with other believers, we know that taking in the Word of God uh, in wherever you can get it is a great step in that faith journey as well. So we urge you, continue to look for people to meet, to gather that we can do that. But watch the live stream, and that's a great way for our faith and your faith to grow. Speaking of gathering, we will be having small groups forming. We had, uh, just this last week, two new small groups formed up um, to start in September. I know September might seem a long way off, but we are forming groups now. And some of these groups will be meeting in person. Some of them will be, be meeting online only. And Maverick Martin is going about and creating pathways and opportunities for those that are looking for online options. So for those of you that are looking for a group, let us know. We would love to get you into a group. We will reach out to you as we are understanding your, your interest in this. So we, we would invite you to join a group. There's some real significant prayer needs going on this week. Those facing cancer, including Marsha, Terry, and Catherine, if you know Alan Campbell, he is going probably right near the end of his life. And I hope that um, you can lift up Susan, his wife, and Alan as they go through this season. And, and whether you know them or not, I encourage you to pray for the Campbell family. I know right now we can pray for our country as far as the leadership. It is difficult to know how to handle the virus and how it should be lived out. Whether that's school board members business leaders, community leaders, and all the way up to President Trump and the the Congress. We need wisdom for our leaders in such a time as this. And honestly, I could use wisdom for me. Pray for me and for the leaders of Bethany Church as we grapple with this new scenario of what that all means. If you look in the bulletin, there are further things you can find out about. One of the things we're definitely highlighting all the time right now is the local missions trip. August 3 through the 7th, we'll be serving in our community. Our focus this year are those that have been quarantined and, and kind of locked in on, on their own, on their own decision, but kind of secluded from society. So we're doing projects at their homes. We're not physically interacting with them, but we will be right outside their windows, right outside their, their doors, serving and ministering with them and to them. And we would invite you to participate in that mission week, whether it's for one morning or one afternoon or the entire week. We have projects that we've lined up. I think we have about eight projects lined up. I think we have about 21 volunteers, but we can take volunteers right up until the day of. 
So we invite you to take that in. And even if you can't participate, would you pray for us? Pray that this missions trip would be something, this local mission would be something that would um, bring together the family of God, that we would encourage one another and would be a witness. It would be crossing of boundaries into a world that needs it so bad. Um, that's all that's going on here. We do have some um, financial needs, and so you can read about that. I praise the Lord. God has provided in in just such good ways in this season and this time. But there are ongoing needs, and if you could contribute to those, we would welcome that. It would help us further the gospel both in our local world and around it. Before we go into the message, let's go ahead and pray together. Let's lift up this time before the Lord and invite him into our presence. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day. I thank you for how you've gathered your people. And sometimes we gather in person, in a building. But Lord, our hearts can be gathered online. And even right now, as people are watching, I pray that they would sense and know your presence and also the community of believers that is all around them. I pray that you would use this message, the book of James, and what it is to pull us in closer to you, to help us be and live and know and understand a little bit closer what it means to live out this faith journey. I pray that you would use this to speak into our hearts and lives. I pray, Lord, that we would not be become too focused just on ourselves. I pray we would understand and realize the world around us. I pray for the local mission trip that's going to help us to meet the needs of people in our community and some of them even in our own church. People that have been quarantined and maybe feel separated from the world. I pray it can be a light in a dark world. I pray for those that are facing tremendous and very difficult health circumstances. I pray for Alan Campbell who's, who's coming off a ventilator this week on Monday and Life could be very short after that. So, Lord, I pray for Susan, Alan's wife, and for Alan as they navigate. I pray for all their family as they go through this season. Lord, I also lift up those facing cancer. I, I thank you and praise you that Marsha's situation seems to be improving. but I And I pray that Catherine has a, um, a better treatment scenario than what she previously had. I pray that those situations for Marsha and Catherine would steadily improve. Lord, we pray also for Terry as she is in hospice care and it is in a very, uh, very precarious spot right now. I pray she can enjoy the days that she has. I pray that you prolong her life and prolong her health. Allow her to have rich times with family and loved ones. Put this all in your hands. Lord, as we Meet as we gather today. Remind us of your provision. Remind us of your grace. Remind us that your way is better. And help us to seek you in the midst of all that we face. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're talking about the lures of life. It's the name of this sermon. It's about how temptation and trouble, the trials... Everything in this life, there's many things that can lure us in and pull us away from the way that God would have for us. Lures look maybe something like this. And I, I was thinking of fishing when these words started. I started reading the, these words. And if you, if you think about it, there's a lot of things about a lure that really are not bad or dangerous at all. The lure itself it's maybe shiny, it's bright. And even the hook itself, if you look carefully at that picture, you can see there's a little point. And if you've ever been hit by a hook, the point itself, it's because it's so small and sharp, many times it doesn't hurt that bad. But at the end of that hook, there's a little barb. There's a little barb. And what happens, that barb gets caught into the fish's mouth and the hook goes in the barb locks it in now that hook can still come out the hook can be removed from the fish's mouth but not without damage without hurt without bleeding without even at some point if it go, if the hook goes too deeply though even if the hook is removed the fish may die and that reminds me 
about this message is what the story in James is all about. James is trying to help us understand how life works, how life happens, and to steer us and put us on a better path. To help me understand this, I was thinking of, of my dog, Bolt. I got a wonderful dog. His name's Bolt. And Bolt's got a problem. Bolt loves chocolate. Now, I, I've heard, and I haven't done any research on this, I've heard chocolate is, is it, uh, dogs are allergic to chocolate. And I don't know if Bolt's allergic to chocolate, but he sure does love chocolate. One time we left a bag of M&M's sitting out in our living room and he, and we forgot it was there. We left, came back and sure enough, he'd eaten an entire family size sharing bag of M&M's. You can imagine what it did to him. He just was not feeling well. The the hook went in and then the barb to get it out, had it, that chocolate had to come out. The lure pulled him in and then he got sick from the chocolate that he was not designed for. He went a different way and he wasn't designed for it and it hurt him greatly. And it hurt all of us because he got sick and we had a mess to clean up. Oh, wouldn't it be something that, you know, if, if that would have been the only problem. But the, the thing is this, both like three days later found some uh, milk duds, I think it was. We had some milk duds sitting out. Again, he got into them. Same thing happened. He got sick. He doesn't learn. We've got to keep chocolate up at our house because even though it hurts him greatly, he can't stop himself. And while we're smarter than a dog, we can maybe think with thought and understand ahead of time, this is a problem. Don't we still fall for the lures, the lures of life. Let's get in today to what James is about and how we can not only understand how the lures work, but God's barriers, God's ways that he's trying to save us from them. James is a practical book. It's about living out our faith. It's it's like the guidebook. It's the, the handy size map that you put it's not the atlas it's not the whole thing it's just the little book that you'd slip into your back pocket and take with you if if a person could take just the book of James out of the bible even though it would only be four or five pages long it it might have more practical insight than any four pages in the entire word of god about what it really means to live this life we're calling this series Real Faith because if we want our faith to grow, if we want our faith to come alive, to be real practical for this day and age, we have to know James. We have to know what he is saying. What James gets into, he packs such a punch right at the very beginning. He starts laying out all the things that he would love to accomplish in his book. And we're going to be getting into that today. James was written by the half-brother of Jesus. And so we know if... If uh, there's one person that understood and understood from the beginning of Jesus' life until later, it would have been James. He saw Jesus develop. He would have known what it would have been like to grow with him. He would have seen the, the hardship on the cross and he would have seen the rising again. He could understand the deep love that Jesus has for people. And I see when I read James, and I hope that you will see this too, this deep love love that God has for us. This love has not changed. We're going to get into that right near the end about the love and the basis for our overcoming temptation is this love that God has for us. Well, James had barely taken leadership in the church when chaos happened. The church was spread out and sent around the world. And so the very opening verse of James, it says it's to the scattered people uh, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Our world is scattered. We've been sent many places, and it's hard to get the word out. I can imagine that when, when James first started his Christian walk and leading the church, everybody was in Jerusalem. They were all together. They could meet daily. They met each other's needs. And it was working so well. And then God, in, in his wisdom, allowed the church to be scattered to the world. 
Now we can look back and we can see that that was a great thing because it brought the gospel around the world. But at the time, it must have been frustrating. Maybe like what we are facing right now. Gathering together is so much harder right now. There's risk right now. We're unsure right now. There's so many things about gathering right now. And many people don't feel because of maybe their job, um, a person in their life they're trying to protect. There's so many reasons why people can't gather. And yet James wrote this letter and he sent it out so that people would know how to live. And I and my prayer, my hope is that this live stream, the way that we're trying to do church right now, where we go into small groups and meet in smaller clusters, this is our way to live out the faith, to live out the way that God always intended. James is about practical faith, and today's message is about as practical as it comes. If we are to live out this faith journey, we're going to need to know what James talks about. Let's read what this says in James chapter 1, starting with verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. First thing that James points out to us, helps us understand, is lures are a reality. He talks about temptation, about being enticed. If lures weren't attractive, they wouldn't work. That fishing lure that you see on the screen, if it didn't have appeal to the fish, no fish would ever bite it. Uh, a fish, uh, sorry, a fisherman who's casting just a hook into the water probably is not going to be very successful. And the fish don't need to worry. But that's not the way temptation works. The lure is how attractive it is. And some of the lures that we have in this life are incredibly attractive. Fish fall for it all the time, and we understand that. When I was growing up, I I went down below the Bloomer Dam, and the dam is still there. We'd go down, and I don't know if you can still go down there. We'd go down there, and we would fish for crappies. And the lure that we found to be most effective was the foo flu. And I don't know if, I've never seen the foo flu in stores anymore. Maybe crappies have moved beyond it. Somebody should make a new foo flu. It was a little feathery lure. I don't have one anymore. And we could cast it on the right good days. The crappies hit it like crazy. I remember one day we caught 80 crappies. And it was amazing. Bobby and Troy and I, we could, we could catch fish. It was so much fun those days. But why does that lure work? How does that lure work? Well, it's attractive to the fish. But attached to that lure is a hook. And then there's that barb. And it holds and it grips the fish and it causes great damage and it pulls that fish out of its environment and puts it where it shouldn't be. The, in the book of James here, it's talking right at the very beginning about the consequences of lures. One way of looking at this passage is he's creating barriers to how sin and temptation can be stopped. The first barrier, the first wall, the first way that the barriers could be stopped is recognizing and knowing the consequences of the sin. And James gets very graphic in how it can happen. Verse 14 says, But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. The word entice means to bait the hook. When temptation comes our way, 
a very delicious, juicy something comes into our world and we are can be pulled into it. Chocolate for a dog isn't good, but Bolt's going to eat it anyways. And the things that we face in this life, it's enticing. It comes before us. And while different things might attract us in different ways, we all have them. Every single one of us. And that's to me why James is such a powerful book because it speaks right to our heart. I know there are things in my life and I am sure there's some in yours that pull us in, that draw us in, that cause us to think about something that we don't want to think about, that makes our mind go places that we know it shouldn't go. And while God designed us without fault because of sin entering life, we have in in intrinsic fault lines that run through us that allow the temptation and sin to grow in us. A weakness that we can be attacked by. If you read the next verse, verse James 1 for verse 15, just listen to the progression that goes through uh, a person's life. And it gets really graphic right at the end. And as I get to this, I, I realize that some people, it might hit close to home. And my job, my my goal is not to create emotional like hurt, but to realize how deep and dark temptation can be. Verse 15, it says this. Then after desire has conceived, after a, a thought, a, a, a little bit of picture, an image, a feeling, a thought, something sparks inside of us and that's where it begins jesus in the sermon on the mount pointed out that adultery is not just the act of adultery it's when we allow it to come into our minds make make no mistake temptation starts in our minds it is absolute progression it is not something we just fall into and end up in it's something that starts in our mind it's when we allow our eyes to see things that we shouldn't it it means when we allow ourselves to have a conversation that goes longer than it should have it it means when we write that little note and we don't need to send it but we do anyways it's the thoughts is where it begins and it starts to grow in us uh in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about how adultery is, starts with lust in our mind. Talks about murder really starts with words and thoughts we have towards those that we love. So each of us gets dragged and pulled for the weakness that is greatness for us. Our mind and the world allows it to be formed in us. It's conceived in us. We imagine what could be like. And the sin then occurs in in our minds first before it's lived out. And finally, it comes to a crashing, horrible end. The end of verse 15 says, When it's full grown, it gives birth to death. And this is the hard part. I This is the really graphic that he, he's describing here. He's, he's describing like a, a baby that's been stillborn. The hope, the love, all these good things a parent or parents might have in that child. And they're thinking and dreaming about all these things that might happen. And that's how sin works. It puts this thought in our mind of all these good things. It's enticing. That verse, James 1.14, it's enticing. It's creates this image about what might be. But sin is this temptation. Instead of giving us life, brings death. It brings great hurt. It brings great harm. Let's face it, lures are a part of life, and we all have them. The lures that are most dangerous and most difficult for us, and this first barrier of consequences that James gives us, the, the first thing is they are realistic. If it was something we we wouldn't um, we knew was um, um, not likely or wouldn't help it, it it wouldn't be so bad. But they are absolutely realistic. They can be dangerous. 
and they're not just they can be they are dangerous it pulls us away and they are very personal each one of us has issues that can hurt us before we look at everyone else and their issues and certainly everyone has them it would be best to look at our own lives and say these are the things that we are struggling with now we are great at inventing excuses for the temptations that we face and why falling into them they are not really our problem i came up with this list this list i found in one of the resources i use and it described all the ways that we give away the the problems that sin might give us we we might say it's the other person's fault it's really not our fault it's what others have done i i couldn't help doing it it's, it's just how i'm wired it's how i'm made everyone is doing it it was just a mistake it was just a little something Another excuse is how nobody is perfect. No, God can't expect perfection. We're not perfect. The devil made me do it. The devil tempted me. I was pressured. The peer pressure, the people all around me pressured me into it. I didn't know it was wrong. I didn't know it would. Maybe God is tempting me. And this is where James changes. This is where James is trying to... Put back on us instead of blaming others, blaming God, blaming the world, bl coming up with all these excuses. He's saying the mature believer, the, the, the person that's taken this book in, walking into the world, the practical believer says, I need to take some personal responsibility to what I face. It is mine to deal with. And while that's difficult to grapple with and it goes against so much of what our world our world wants to just say it wasn't your fault our world wants to get it off the hook society might even say that what james is saying is there's a certain amount of responsibility it comes back to us and if we don't handle it the consequences are huge the hurt and i i i know a few people that have had a stillborn baby. I can't imagine the devastation. And they, they, they describe the hurt. God, in his love for his people, says, I don't want you to face the consequences. So he says, stay away from the sin. Be aware of the consequences. That could be the first barrier to stop us from the lure of sin. But then it changes. It's not just the consequences that James uses. He talks about the character of and attributes of God. James 1, 16 and 17 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation, or due to change, or shadow due to change. So right after the verse on temptation and the consequences, it slips into something, a different barrier, a barrier of how God is good, the consequences are horrible, but God is good, and God's goodness can keep us from the hurt. To fear God and to understand his judgment is, is a healthy thing. But to know the love of God, that can help balance out that fear we have of him. Let's walk through James 1 verse 17 very carefully. Look at this verse as on, on the screen behind me as I walk through this. First of all, think about how good God is as, you re as we read this verse. God only gives good gifts. Every good gift. Every good thing in this world comes from him. If it wasn't good, it wasn't from God. So while everything good comes from God, the world does, this world does have distortions of the good gifts. So God gives us food as a resource. Too much food hurts us. God gives us drugs to help our bodies handle what might come and even take away some of the pain of this world. But drugs used in the wrong way can greatly hurt us. God gave us eyes and we can have these images in us so that we can um, see attractive and see this amazing world that is around us. But these images can also hurt us. These words that we speak. So all these good gifts... The words we speak, they can be such good and bring life, but they can also bring death. 
So every good gift, all the good things in this world, they were gifts of God for us to remember that. The way that God gives also is good. Every perfect gift, if you read that line in that verse, every perfect gift could be translated as every act of giving. So even the way that God gives his gifts is a good thing. Have you ever gotten a gift that was diminished because of how it was given to you? Yeah, I didn't really need this anymore. Do you want it? I guess that's a gift, but is it really? You feel like you feel like you're getting the leftovers. And what God does, God doesn't give gifts like that. He gives it in the way that we need to receive it. We see that in this verse, God gives continually. That that little phrase, they're coming down, is is a present participle. What that means is it's an ongoing action. It's coming down. So these gifts are coming down in its ongoing basis. It's here every single day. I, I think about how this summer it seemed like I've seen so many remarkable sunsets. Every single night, God paints in the sky these sunsets. If you, we go out at night, we see the amazing stars. Some dear dear people from Bethany have been on a trip and they went to Glacier National Park. I've been to Glacier. It is amazing. Those places, those sunsets, those stars, they're there every single day. The Wolf River flows beautifully every single day. All these things are beautiful. God does it. He gives these gifts all the time. We only capture a, a tiny segment of what he's doing. He just throws this out all the time, continually. Our God is good. Also, God doesn't change. It says there at the end, for there's no variation or shadow due to change. He is not the God of shadows. He is the God of light. He is showing us this better way. So while one barrier to sin and temptation is the consequences, but another barrier that James is setting up is God is so good. He's giving us a better way. He's showing us a better way to do life. And we might obey God to avoid judgment, but we also might do the right thing because we know he's so much better. So God gives these gifts and they're, they're better than a bargain from Satan because they're only going to bring rich reward. But have you ever wondered if these are gifts, maybe I don't want it? There's a t-shirt I've seen before. It said something like, if, if today was a fish, I'd throw it back. Meaning it's such a lousy day. And some people would probably say, 2020, if this is a gift from God, he can have it back. I don't want anything to do with it. So if God's giving gifts, but we don't like it, what are we to do with that? Just want to remind myself and I remind you, the best gift that God can ever give any of us is his relationship, a relationship from us to him. That's what he most wants. Everything in this world and in this life is just... Uh, uh, a sh a, not even a full representation of what God would want to give his people. When we go through trial, we go through temptation, we go through these difficulties here on earth, when we go through the middle of a coronavirus that has changed something for all of us, it's a reminder that our good God wants something so much better for his people. Now, maybe we want to send back 2020. Let's get a different year. Let's just kick it to the curb and get something to... Maybe what this year might do more than anything is remind us this world is not all there is. We can have something better. Don't let the difficulties, the trials, and the temptations take it away from God wants to give us good gifts and draw us closer to himself. He wants to give us something else. He wants to give us life. So James is setting up these barriers. There's consequences that will hurt us, stay away from sin, it's going to hurt us, it's going to be, the price to be paid is too high. But he also says these are good gifts, these are good gifts that God can give us, and these gifts are ways for him to bring a relationship with him, and ultimately 
we can accept the Lord of this life. We can accept him instead. He offers a new relationship. He's saying, as he look inside, in, inside of each one of us, I can give you life. I can give you life to the full. So birth, think about this, this story of life that we have. Birth, it gives a newness to things. Newness that we've never had before. He offers something new. He's restoring us as things should be. He's working for us. He's working through us. He's, a, he's doing something to help us understand and know him. That we are chosen. We are special. Verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. No, skip forward. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be kind of first fruits of all he created. Now here in life, here in life, choosing isn't always a good thing. But when God chooses, it is an awesome, excellent thing. I coach a soccer team. And right now they're in the middle of playing a lot of pickup games. And so they have to divide teams. One way to divide teams, and you probably remember this from the good old days on the playground, the two captains, the two upperclassmen, the two leaders, the two seniors, whatever, they divide them. They take turns picking. And of course, you get right down to the end. There's two that are left over. And it's like, well, do you want them? Do you want? No, you can take them. All right. It's almost like, what does, okay, so what does that communicate? Communicates to those people the value that they have. So one of the things that I do, I'm, so I'm a soccer coach. One of the things I believe it's my job into yeah, win games, teach soccer skills, but more than any of all that, my job is to instill a better way of seeing life. And what James is doing right here in this passage, he's saying, we don't have to live like this world. We don't have to be chosen last. Instead, we understand because God sees in us and he sees our value, he is choosing us. And he isn't choosing us so we could build a grander, bigger building. He isn't choosing us so the offering plate can be filled. He's not choosing us for any of the reasons why the world might choose. He is choosing us because he wants us with him. He wants relationship with him. And so because he wants to choose us, he wants to give us life. He's saying, stay away from the things that are going to separate us. So God invites us to life. Look about this, this word here. He chose us to give us birth. And through he does this. We are given his word through the word of truth. He speaks life into us. He shows us stay away. So we have this relationship with God. The, the barrier to trials, the barrier to sin is real. If I can stay away from these things and instead of choosing those things, choose who he is about. This life that he wants can start coming to us. He wants to pour into this life. Now, we understand that it is coming in eternity, but it can happen right now. And we're told that we are his prize at the very end, that we might be the kind of first fruits of all he created. What he's saying there right at the end of that verse is, my goodness, you're like the best. It's like James is taking us back to his Jewish roots, and his Jewish heritage, saying like, we are like the very first thing that they brought to the tabernacle. We're the very best thing that God wants. So all of this creation, all the animals, all the beautiful mountains, the rivers, the, the people, the, the, everything in this world, the, those that he has chosen and brought to himself, that is the most important thing. Question is, do we really believe that? I, I know maybe in our minds we know this, but do we believe this? Do you believe that he really is this life? Do we believe that this is the possibility that we could have? I say that because we live in a time of death. We know that domestic violence is going up and drug use is going up. Just watch the news. The coronavirus is every. There's so much negativity. More than that, it's very personal. I see families hurting. If this is the life that God has, why is it so difficult? Why is it so tough? Why is it so rough? And I'm reminded again and again, 
This world is not all that there is. We can experience a different kind of life as we choose him. God has chosen us and he doesn't want us to live that way. He doesn't want us to have to live like the rest of the world, just seeking the temptation that will get us through the, the, the weak things. Instead, he wants us to have to choose the best things. He wants us to understand that we are his prize. Instead of choosing the cheap imitation, the, 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 the temptation, the lures, those things that, that are going to hurt us, Choose him. Choose his life instead. As we consider what this all means, I encourage you to think about the next steps that you might take in your life so that this life that he intended might come close to you. First thing to consider, what is the most dangerous lure that you have in your life right now? What is something that you know you are dealing, maybe even this afternoon, maybe even right now, you're facing the actions the words the mindset that could absolutely bring you down and you know it will come with great cost be aware of that the first thing we could do is we could share that with those we love let them know and share our our, our concern that we have for this area of our life with the lord next is to consider the good gifts god has given us god has granted us so many good things what are those good things? When we remember how many good things God has given, it's easier to choose and fall after those good things. And then finally, how do you see God choosing you? God chose you. Why did he choose you? Realize you are chosen. That is why he came on earth. That's why he sent his son, not to build this great building or to to accomplish some great he came because he just loves you so much our key verse this week i'm actually going to take you back what i believe is the introduction verse to this entire passage blessed is the one who perseveres under trial blessed blessed are we blessed are us when we face trial and persevere underneath it because Having stood that test, that person will receive the crown of life that God has promised for those who love him. Living in this world will mean trial. It will mean temptation. It will mean those things. But as we face those trials and persevere through it, it leads to the crown of life. And this is where it finishes. Notice how it finishes to those who love him. What is required? To love him. He doesn't ask for perfection. He asks us to choose him. And I and I think through the stories of the Bible, the characters of the people, Abraham and, and David and Samson, the people, uh, uh, James and John and Peter, uh, all these characters, all these rich characters. And I think of the people in my own life, my mom, my dad, the people that have had the greatest influence on my life. God promises this kind of life to those that love him. He's saying, stay away from the trial. Stay away from these things. It's going to bring great harm. Don't let, and choose me because I love you as well. The rich life that God promised, that James is trying to get the practical ways, if we can face this trial and overcome it, he will give us this life. It's based on love and we got this. Bethany Church, this week, we may face trial. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we do face trial. I wouldn't be surprised if temptation lands right in our lap, right on our doorstep. What will we do with it? Because of the great love that we have for God, I believe we can overcome and see this carnal life come to us. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for reminding us that while there is trial, there is temptation, there are difficulties in this world. There's also a way to live. Remind us of the consequences that come from sin. Remind us how you are giving good gifts. And ultimately, Lord, remind us and help us understand that life comes from you. Help us reject the temptation so we can have a closer and richer walk with you. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of James and how it shows us in practical means how to live out this life. I pray that we can do that even this week. 
In Jesus' name, amen. As you go this week, may you understand and see the trials that's coming as the lure, as the, the problem that it really is. My hope is that you'll see the good gifts that God is giving and you'll choose this life, not the hurt of the temptation, but the good life that God is giving. May we choose that this week. Go and know the power of the Holy Spirit is in you to do that. God bless.